Dr. Robert, you mentioned earlier about the adverse risks, and that's something uh, about the and that's something that we we have to address because it's also um, an issue that uh, some of the press don't want to talk about a lot. Is that a, a, a subject of concern, uh, the adverse effects of some of these vaccines or not? Because it's all, all drugs and all vaccines usually have adverse uh, risks. It's, it's part of the, it's part of the, of the, of the drugs. But what's your view on this question? This part? Okay. Um, so this is an important question. Thank you for sh for throwing it to me. Thank you. For um, here. Uh, the uh, so the issue about the adverse events associated with the vaccine. No vaccines are perfect. No drugs are perfect. All drugs have toxicity. Very few vaccines produce what we call sterilizing immunity. Few, if any. Uh, sterilizing immunity doesn't mean that it makes you unable to have children, but rather that the virus doesn't replicate in your body. So there are very few vaccines, if any, that are able to achieve this. this these vaccines are also imperfect. What matters, in my opinion, is that a few things. Number one, that you all understand what those risks are, what the risks are of taking the vaccine. Not because this would uh, cause you to not take the vaccine. I believe this is a fundamental of, of the Hippocratic Oath and of the physician-patient relationship. And it's also a fundamental of what we call bioethics, this field of study and, and agreement that we've developed largely since World War II and the Nuremberg trials. It's important to remember back to the Nuremberg trials. In this context, the, if, if you think back in time, the logic of, of what was done the medical experimentation was the German soldiers were being subjected to cold on the uh, Russian front and in the northern front in Finland and Norway. And the German state believed that it was uh, for the common good that individuals be subjected to medical treatments against their will for the, for the rights of the common good. And so there were experiments done on individuals without their permission. And after this became known, there were trials. And it, the Western world agreed that this was not acceptable. And of course, there was a punishment handed out that was quite sharp, and we don't need to talk about that. But um, we all agreed as a people in the West that we would never do this again. And yet then we started to backslide. And so then we had the Helsinki Accord. And that was fine for a while. And then in the United States, the precursor of the CDC had the Tuskegee experiments, where people of African American descent in the South were subjected to medical experimentation without their knowledge. And then we had another period of inward looking in the United States, and we created the Belmont Report. And then we put this into US law. We call it the common rule. The common rule has three key elements. Those are that you must have anyone agreeing to a medical procedure, whether it's experimental or not, but particularly if it's an experimental product, like under emergency use authorization, they have the right to be fully informed of all the risks. That's like when you take the package that your drugs come in in the little piece of paper, 
and you read that little piece of paper and you say, hmm, these things don't sound so bad, and then you read all the way down and you say, good heavens, aspirin might kill me, or Tylenol. Tylenol can kill you, right? The acetaminophen, if you take too much. So this is the level of disclosure of adverse event risks that you are owed according to what we've all agreed in the West. Number two, those risks have to be stated in a way that you can understand them. Not using fancy words that doctors use, but words that you can understand. Number three, you have to freely consent to that medical intervention. You cannot be coerced, you cannot be compelled, you cannot be enticed, okay? What is coercion? Coercion is when the state and the media tell you you must do these things. <laughs> Being compelled is when the state tells you that you have no choice. You will take this procedure. Okay, this is the mandate. What is this word enticed? Enticement is, for instance, when we give out ice cream to children to get them to take the vaccine. That's enticement. Um, and this is being practiced in some countries like Canada. Uh, so these things we all agreed back in after World War II, we would not do these things. And yet here we are doing them. Okay? So that's, I think that's important to remember in our own minds. And one of the things that I find unique about the people of Portugal is that you have had the experience of Salazar. And in the United States, we don't have this experience. We haven't lived through it. We haven't had the elders that have experienced this type of government. And we think that this can never happen. But the Portuguese people know that it can. And it, it gives them a certain wisdom uh, that I personally find um, particularly attractive and I, and I, and it, it, it gives, I have love for this with the Portuguese people because they have this wisdom of having had this experience. And, and I think that, that the, I hope if, if, if I had my way, uh, the Portuguese would continue in their modern tradition of liberty and respect for the individual and would lead the rest of Europe and the world in insisting on this respect. So getting back to the vaccines, um, there are adverse events associated with these vaccines. Perhaps most importantly, we do not understand all of these adverse events. So we know that children, and recently there is claims in the VRBAC meeting that we talked about, that the risk of cardiac damage, and, and these physicians will tell you that the heart does not heal. You don't get new heart cells when they're damaged. You get scars. This is why all this research about cardiac stem cells, because these cells, once they're damaged, form scars. And scars in the heart can cause things like changes in electricity transmission in the heart, which is so important for heart contraction. So this, these things, these people that say, oh, don't worry, these, this damage to the heart is transitory, it doesn't mean anything, it'll go away, it doesn't matter for the children. I disagree with this, um, and many others do, particularly pathologists. So we know that there are these cardiac events of pericarditis and myocarditis. We also know that there are these uh, coagulation events, and this includes thrombotic thrombocytopenia, a fancy medical word, that means that you have low blood platelets develop after vaccination in some people. 
and this can cause you to have problems with blood clotting. Uh, so this is another type of adverse event. Another type of adverse event that is not yet officially recognized and yet widely known by practicing physicians is what we call viral reactivation. The most obvious of this type of event is the person that has previously had the disease in childhood called chickenpox, and then they develop what's called shingles, these, these pustular lesions on, on one side of their body in certain areas. This is extremely painful, but it's not the only virus, latent virus, that gets reactivated. There are a number of viruses that do this, and they also may be contributing to some of these long-term side effects from the virus itself, from the infection that we call long COVID. And there are some that have long COVID-like symptoms after vaccination, not very many, but some. So that's another type of adverse event. Another one that was just recently published in The Lancet that um, I found appalling is that many, many women, women of reproductive age, have described that they have changes in their period, in their cycle, after vaccination. And in some of these women, these changes last. Some of them, it just happens for a little while. Some of them, it lasts. There's also reports of older women that have past menopause that then start having their period. Physicians that are familiar with oncology are aware that this is often a sign of potential cancer. That doesn't mean that this is going to mean cancer, but it is a very unusual thing to see the older postmenopausal woman start having periods again. And, and it is worrisome to gynecologists and oncologists that this is happening because usually it's a sign of cancer. It doesn't mean that it's a sign of cancer in this case. But what was particularly unusual about these many reports from women is that they were largely overlooked. And this gets to the core concern. Are, are we really able, as, as the regulatory authorities, we, we trust in the public health system to accurately sample and detect these kinds of drug-related adverse events. And when we see these cases where, in this example, women have been reporting this phenomena, and yet there's been no attention paid to it, they keep We've lost the mic. There we go. Are we back? Nope. Lost the mic. Okay. Are you are you able to now? We've, now it's back. Okay. So when when we hear this, uh, there we go. So when we hear this pattern of people, patients reporting things, and then not being recognized by the authorities, this raises concerns. I think. So, in sum, about the adverse events, we don't really know what they are. So therefore, we can't really assess whether this is a good thing or a bad thing for us to take these vaccines. We have, I think it's un I believe, and I suspect my colleagues here also, um, we're in this very odd position where normally we have this physician-patient relationship that is the center of the practice of medicine. And we find ourselves in this odd situation where the government and the media are interjecting themselves in the middle of this relationship. and. Um, This is, if I forgive my rant, um, I, I believe that we must get back to allowing physicians to practice medicine and get the media out of it and get the government out of it. So have I addressed your question?